Thanks again to everybody for joining this webinar. So uh, this webinar today, for those of you who don't already know, forms part of a project that we're running at the Institution of Environmental Sciences over the course of 2023, which is called Turning the Tide, Systems Thinking for a Sustainable Ocean. Um, so yeah, just to introduce today's event then. So uh, the webinar today is on unlocking the sustainable blue economy from vision to realization. We're really pleased to be joined by Professor Colin Moffat today, who retired from the post of Chief Scientific Advisor Marine to the Scottish Government in 2021. He currently holds visiting and honorary professor, professor post at Robin, Robert Gordon <laughs> University and Harriet Watt University in Scotland. And he's also a trustee of the Scottish Association of Marine Science. So uh, Colin will give a presentation for around about 30 minutes today. And then after that, there will be a chance for questions from our audience. Um, so I will now hand over to Colin and thanks to everyone for joining again. Thank you very much, uh, everybody. And good afternoon and welcome to um, the, the uh, seminar uh, this afternoon. Um, so what I would like to do is just spend the next 30 minutes or so speaking about why it really is fundamental that we value uh, the seas. And I'd like to start perhaps by maybe being a wee bit controversial when I actually say that for many of you who, 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 who've been to school and been told there are multiple oceans, there is actually only one ocean. It is a unified body of water, and it is literally essential for life on Earth. It covers 70% of the surface of the planet. And as you can see uh, in that diagram there, if you look at the Earth from a slightly different perspective, in other words, look at it um, from uh, at the South Pole in the middle, you can actually see the expanse of ocean that um, is 1.33 times 10 to the 21 litres, um, which is 520,000 billion Olympic swimming pools. So there's a lot of water uh, on planet Earth. And as I say, it is a unified body of water. And it's important to get that message across because what it means is if it's unified, it's interconnected. And therefore, it is a mass of interconnected water which moves. And as it moves, it moves energy around. It moves nutrients around. And so it is a very dynamic process which affects every single human on the planet. Now, it's, it's a wonderful environment. And I'll highlight just two areas um, at this stage. First of all, the Mariana Trench which is 10,984 meters depth, which actually means you could drop Everest into it and you would lose Mount Everest under the water. I think a key thing about it is that at that depth, uh, the pressure is 1,086 bar, the temperature is 1.4 degrees and the saltiness is 36 practical salinity units, which is slightly saltier um, than the surface ocean. But an important thing at that depth where it's absolutely pitch black, there are creatures living. In this case, it's home to the vampire sharks and the zombie worms. But these areas are not desolate of life. There is life throughout the whole ocean. Now, the other area that I've highlighted there is the clarion clipperton fracture zone. And where I, have I highlighted that area specifically? Well, humans have used, in some cases, abused our environment for a very long time. And one of the things that we're needing um, are a number of specific metals. And in the clarion clipperton fracture zone, are metallic nodules, and we're thinking of mining that particular area. However, a recent study published just um, a couple of months ago has indicated 
that in that area, there's an estimated 88 to 92% of the species are undescribed. Now that, of course, is a percentage. What does that mean in absolute terms? Well, they looked and found about 5,500 species, of which 5,142 were unnamed. And so there is still a massive amount that we don't know, we don't understand about our marine environment. So before we exploit it, we need to understand it. And part of that understanding actually comes about because we need to really look at and understand the ocean from the 100 nanometer non-tailed viruses to the 30 meter long blue whale, which is an aorta that's 23 centimeters in diameter. And there's every single size, color in between that. And there's a number of examples there. But a key thing is that this quite complex set of ecosystems has developed over a significant period of time. And there is a careful balance to be sought between the temperature, in other words, the, the, the physical characteristics, the chemical characteristics, and the biological characteristics. And all these components, the, the viruses, the bacteria, the phytoplankton, the zooplankton, the lower trophic levels, and then ultimately to the, the apex predators, make up a fascinating, complex, but an absolutely incredible set of ecosystems. And to give you an example, up there in the top right-hand corner is the ocean quahog. And we get quite a lot of ocean quahogs around Scotland, especially on our, our west coast. And these particular animals can live for more than 500 years. And so when Shakespeare was writing A Midsummer Night Dream, that particular ocean quahog may have been alive, perhaps a very, very small ocean quahog, but could have been alive back when Shakespeare uh, was writing him in the Summer's Night's Dream. So not only is it a dynamic, moving, single mass of water, but it is life in it that can live for many, many years. And there are other animals uh, in the sea that can live for equally long time, while some of the, 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 the uh, biology have quite short lives. But all this makes up what is the natural ocean. And a key thing about the natural ocean is that it provides us, provides humans with significant services. And on that wheel there, it's sort of divided into four, provisioning, supporting, regulating, and cultural. And this is where we start to think about the services, the blue economy, what the ocean actually provides us with. And at the moment, roundabout um, worth in terms of, of dollars is 1.5 trillion. But the OECD reckon that this will become close to 3 trillion by 2030. And the global blue economy contributes to about 1.5% of the global workforce and 2.5% of global GDP. Now, of course, these are, are figures and they're, they're very big figures, but let's look and go back to that um, benefits from the ocean wheel. And many of us will probably be familiar with the, the provisioning aspect of it, because I think we all, or many of us, will like uh, fish and shellfish. And humans, have eaten food from the sea um, for millennia. Energy from the sea is something that's perhaps a bit more recent and historically has been based around hydrocarbons. But more recently, we've been transitioning towards renewable energy. But also, of course, seaweed has been used and harvested, especially around Scotland. The kelp was harvested for a long time and seaweed is coming back as a material that could be grown and harvested in the sea. 
So that provisioning, I think we well recognize, but there's many other things that we get from the sea. And one of them uh, is on, on the left-hand panel there, Yondelis. And Yondelis is a, 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 a chemical that's used to treat adults with advanced soft tissue sarcoma. And it's about 1% of adult cancers that it can treat. And this is actually was found originally in an extract from a sea squirt. Now it's not the sea squirt that actually produces it, it's a bacterium associated with the sea squirt that produces it. But what we are realizing is that there are a number of very, very active drugs um, that can be obtained from creatures in the sea. And marine biotechnology is an increasing sphere. And you'll see there's a wee icon there, marine biotechnology. And I'm introducing this fairly early on because one of the key things I'm going to be speaking about in a few minutes is how Scotland has taken this forward. And in part, we've done it by creating a whole lot of blue carbon icons and the marine biotechnology is there. And of course, um, on the right hand side, there are others because what is often less known is that actually about 50% of the oxygen that we breathe comes from the ocean. The other thing is that our ocean provides unique ecosystems and these ecosystems actually can contribute to natural coastal defense in terms of um, mangroves, uh, uh, for example. But also in terms of um, moving goods around the planet, um, the ocean provides us with an amazing opportunity of, of transporting goods around the planet. And of course, ships uh, are, are a key tool for this. And it's interesting to note that recently, um, the ships have reduced the amount of sulfur uh, that is in the fuel that they're using and that ultimately therefore that is being emitted. And they actually think that um, slightly ironically, um, this might have slightly increased um, the greenhouse gas effect because in fact, the aerosols produced um, from the sulfur um, actually have a slight cooling effect. Anyway, that's a, that's a wee bit of, a, a, of an aside, but what we see here is that we've got the provisioning, but we've also got the supporting side. Now, I've alluded to this already in terms of nutrient cycling, in terms of the movement of heat uh, around the planet. And of course, that's tied in very much with the ocean currents. And you know, the, the UK and indeed Western Europe is probably about five degrees C warmer for our latitude than we would normally expect. And that's because of the um, Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, which moves heat from the tropics up north. And as it comes north, it comes out of the water and goes into the atmosphere and basically heats us up. And there's a risk actually that this particular northward movement of water may slow up or may flip into another state. And if it does that, the consequences for um, the climate of Western Europe uh, could be fairly significant. Now, the other thing I've got there is regulating. What's this about? Well, when you think about the fact that um, the ocean has absorbed something like a quarter of the additional carbon dioxide that has been produced by humans since the Industrial Revolution, then you can see that it's actually acting as a huge buffer. It's also absorbed 93% of the additional heat energy that's been produced by the increased concentration in greenhouse gases. And that has, of course, had consequences in that we're seeing a reduction in the pH of the ocean, but we're also seeing a warming. And as the ocean warms, it can hold less oxygen. So we're seeing a deoxygenation. So what this means is reduction in pH, increase in temperature, reduction in oxygen. The ecosystems and the animals that are living in these ecosystems that are part of these ecosystems are experiencing very different conditions and therefore how sustainable is the ocean um, is a significant question. And if the ocean become, um, moves into other states, that will have significant co uh, consequences for our blue economy. And of course, the other thing is the cultural aspects. We all like to go to the beach and it's actually been shown that people living on the coast actually are happier and live longer than people living in land. There's a spirituality associated with the marine environment. And also there's a lot of 
creativity and art around it. So actually, the benefits of the ocean are huge. And whether it's provisioning, providing us food, providing us with energy, whether it's cultural, spiritual, whether it's acting as a buffer, regulating and absorbing additional heat, absorbing additional carbon dioxide, or indeed moving heat and nutrients around, it is fundamental to life and air. And actually, um, oh, why is it not moving? There we go. Um, humans, we must say, benefit from, but in fact, indeed rely on what nature provides. And the natural environment, the processes that sustain it, provide wide ranging benefits for people. Both basically saying the same thing, but just emphasizing the criticality of the ocean to human sustainability. But there's a problem. And part of the problem is the fact that there are, as of today, um, over 8 billion humans on the planet. And as humans, we have produced a lot of pollution, be it um, nutrient pollution. And some of you will have seen issues around um, house building and that recently uh, on the news and the, the, the around nutrients, but not only nutrients, uh, organic chemicals, inorganic chemicals, so polychlorinated by phenol, mercury, pharmaceuticals, personal care products. I did some research uh, in the Clyde estuary where uh, we found um, an antidepressant um, in the water um, in the Clyde. And also um, uh, we found some of these uh, pharmaceuticals actually in some of the fish. But also there's noise pollution and uh, whether it be ship noise, whether it be the noise from putting the um, piling uh, for the offshore uh, structures. And light pollution, we produce a lot of light um, and, and that has an impact on the marine environment. But also we've mentioned extraction, whether it's the nodules, energy, fish or, 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 or other foods. Tourism often is associated with um, the, the coast. And that has an impact in the coast, water abstraction, additional waste being produced, plastics being produced. But also the effect of humans uh, and moving around the planet is we move invasive non-native species. And as the, the water temperature changes, as the chemistry and the physics change, some of these animals can establish themselves where previously they wouldn't. We've got a loss of natural protection. We've got a loss of biodiversity. So ultimately what we see is that the ocean's natural capital and its related services are in fact fragile to what ultimately is cumulative pressures from human activities. And ultimately the failure to account for such contributions, i.e. the services and the benefits, has led to the prioritization of economic values and fact to the detriment of ocean ecosystems. So we're in a wee bit of a downward spiral in terms of the environmental component because we've tended to favor the economic and the social. However, things have changed and things are continuing to change. And the change probably started um, in the early 2000s. And Scotland has a vision we have a vision for clean, healthy, safe, productive, biologically diverse marine and coastal environments managed to meet the long-term needs of people and nature. And this was actually endorsed in a document called Seize the Opportunity, a strategy for the long-term sustainability of Scotland's coasts and seas in 2005. So we actually have a vision which has stuck around for nearly 20 years and is still used and absolutely applicable in 2023. And an important thing there is there's two points I make. First of all, long term. Second of all, people and nature. So very early on, Scotland was thinking about the fact that it's not just people, it's people and nature. And back in 2005, we were thinking about a strategy for the long term sustainability of Scotland's coast and seas. And of course, sustainability has become a, a very commonly used word. But back in 2005, these concepts of people and nature, long-term sustainability, were slightly less at the forefront of our thinking. Now, what this led to was a process of progression. 
because in 2008, we produced Scotland Seas towards understanding her state, and that then resulted in Scotland's first marine bill. We then produced Scotland's Marine Atlas, um, and that was an account of how we were delivering our vision, so how clean, how safe, how biologically diverse, how productive, in other words, the blue economy aspect, we didn't call it so much blue economy, we called it productive seas, um, and that, in fact, was the information, the base information that resulted in 2015 in Scotland's first national marine plan. And this was, a, again, a framework for taking all aspects of human activities and managing our seas. Now, we have to be careful when we say managing our seas, because it's not the seas specifically that we manage, it's the human activities that impact on our seas. And then in 2020, we produced Scotland's Marine Assessment. And this was looking at, well, how effective have we been? And it was looking right back to 2008 and making comparisons as to how were we doing? And the interesting thing is that by 2020, we had a whole chapter on natural capital, which is, of course is the habitats and ecosystems that provide social, environmental, and economic benefits to humans. And it had a, a, a chapter on ecosystem services, which are the specific functions and resources of nature that provide benefits for people. So actually this language has now become mainstream. It's now become very much how we think, but it's taken some time to get it. And what this has culminated in in 2022 is the blue economy vision for Scotland. And what has happened is that we've taken these ideas and yes, it's taken a wee while, but we now have a very clear blue economy vision, taking account of the habitats and ecosystems that provide social, environmental, and economic benefits. And it's a wee bit like fish and chips now, that we should not be thinking about the fish or the chips, we should be thinking about fish and chips. So we should not just be thinking about social aspects, we should not just be thinking about environmental aspects, we should not be thinking about economic aspects, but it's social, environmental, and economic. And similarly, we need to really appreciate that the ecosystems are providing us with resources that ultimately we benefit from. So here's the vision that we have in Scotland for Scotland's blue economy, that by 2045, Scotland's shared stewardship of our marine environment supports ecosystem health, improved livelihoods, economic prosperity, social inclusion, and well-being. And this is going a wee bit further, but ecosystem health and good environment, improved livelihoods is about it things being better for people, economic prosperity, social inclusion, we want everybody to be part of it, and of course the well-being. And so I've sort of put them all together in terms of the we sort of put the three words together. And this is how we have to really start thinking. We could think slightly differently that Nowadays, I don't think we can really have pure environmental scientists or pure economists or pure social scientists. We all have the specialities, but we've all to think about a wee bit about the social aspects, a wee bit about the economic aspects, a wee bit about the environmental aspects, um, majoring on one of the three, but taking into account the others. And ultimately, what we should feel is that our economy and our society are embedded in nature, that they are not separate strong economy, strong society will go hand in hand with a well-maintained nature. And this should come about by supporting collaborative and co-productive actions. And the areas covered by uh, Scotland's uh, blue economy are within uh, the, the, the icons there, there are 25 of them. And not surprisingly, you've got the, the provisioning in terms of oil and gas and renewables and Ports, but you've got environmental protection, you've got fish processing, and important there are skills and training, because this is also about um, making people aware, becoming ocean literate, a phrase that was first coined in America in 2004. But also it's about health and well-being, it's about coastal defence, it's about um, sustainable food, high quality food, because we know that fish as a, as, as a food is very nutritious, it's very beneficial uh, to, to health. But in some areas due to pollution, there are risks and we've got to de-risk um, that environment. 
And key to this is marine science, because we need to understand what's happening, but also social science and economic science. So we've got to take all this together to make up Scotland's new economic vision. Now, um, basically, what is the importance of Scotland's blue economy? And there are many, many examples there. And this is taken from the, the vision document. But when you see that we've got 18,743 kilometers of coastline, and that in fact, the blue carbon stored in uh, Scotland's marine environment, the 9,636 million tons, is equivalent to the total carbon stored in Scotland's terrestrial ecosystem, you start to see other criticalities coming through in terms of the importance of um, blue carbon and the marine environment. You know, Scotland's marine area is many, many times greater than our landmass. And we are developing 1.9 gigawatts of um, offshore capacity. And we're looking to um, develop even more offshore capacity and moving more towards floating capacity as well and creating 2,200 jobs. So, there's jobs, there's money, there's well-being. Um, but also, as it says, there's home to 6,500 complex and 40,000 single cell species. And we're trying to protect some of that through a marine protected area network that covers 37% of Scotland's seas. But also we've got many around Scotland inhabited islands and feeding in to the sea are our 125,000 kilometers of rivers and streams. We have a major export of salmon from our salmon farmed industry, 40% of total UK fish and seafood experts, uh, exports. So what you see here is the value uh, to Scotland. Now, this is a lot of words. How do we turn words into outcomes? Because that's a key thing. We're beginning to realize the criticality. We're beginning to realize the importance. And so what we've done is they've come up, Scottish government has come up with six outcomes, two economic, two social, and two environmental. And at the heart of that is the one ocean, one earth, one home, one shared future. And round about that are the two environmental outcomes around Scotland's blue economy, that is resilient to climate change. Climate change is the biggest impact and it's the effects of climate change the biggest impact in Scotland's um, seas at the moment. So we have to somehow help it to be resilient to climate change. It's already contributing to climate mitigation, but that's having an impact and we need to think a wee bit more about that. We need to help decarbonize some of our um, resources and ultimately need to go to net zero and nature positive commitments. And that's quite a challenge actually. But also we want Scotland's marine ecosystems to maintain and be healthy and functioning because functioning ecosystems, functioning naturally and not tipped over into um, a non-returnable tipping point, not going beyond that, is absolutely fundamental. And in part, we're going to be doing that by thinking about the ecosystem as an approach, not just thinking about individual animals, but thinking about interactions, thinking about the physics, the chemistry, the biology, how they interact. And then, of course, we've got to think about the, the economics in terms of Scotland being a, a global leader in uh, providing sustainable, healthy food. We want to be a bit imaginative, and Scotland's got a long history of entrepreneurship. But also, we want to have um, communities that understand, are living by the sea, are benefiting from the sea. And part of that is that Scotland is a notion literate and aware nation. Now, looking again at this, a key thing is that Scotland's not doing this in isolation. Part of this ties in with, first of all, um, the national performance framework, so the wider performance for Scotland, but it also ties in with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And what this figure here illustrates is in the middle circle, we have our vision, 2045, Scotland's vision. We've got the one ocean, one earth, one home, one shared future. Coming out from that to the first ring are the six um, blue economy outcomes. And then beyond that, the next the middle ring are the national outcomes in terms of the national performance framework. And then we're tying in the sustainable development goals. And Scotland signed up to delivering the sustainable development goals. 
And so what you can see there is how local, national, international um, is tying together to ultimately deliver commonly. And if we're tying in with the SDC and Sustainable Development Goals, then clearly this is going to tie across to what other countries are doing, to what the Regional Sea Convention for the Northeast Atlantic is doing, and for what others are doing. But the key thing is people. And we should never forget that this is about how people are going to have to change what they do. This is about how people are going to have to better understand the consequence of their actions. And so actually, we do want people to become more ocean literate. And what does this mean? We want to help people to understand the essentials, principles, and fundamental concepts of the ocean. We want the people to be able to communicate about the ocean in a meaningful way. And we also want people to make informed and responsible decisions regarding the ocean and its resources. So provision of information resulting in key decision making. And we want people to be doing this on a wide basis. We want our school pupils to be doing it. We want our teenagers to be doing it. We want our young adults to be doing it. We want everybody uh, to be doing it. So a key objective has to be get out there and tell people about the criticality of the ocean, what it provides, and why we must balance between social, economic, and environmental. And part of this has been looked at in terms of uh, Marine Scotland carried out an attitudes survey. Um, a social attitude to the sea survey. And several things came out. First of all, people had a clear affinity to the sea. But, uh, and in fact, many of them thought that Scotland's seas were not protected well enough. But most of the people thought, over 80%, thought that government or businesses had to do more to protect the environment. And of course, basically what we need to be delivering is clear and effective messages from us to business to government so that ultimately we want to he hear people speaking about environment, social impact, economic impact, and tying them together. And so that's actually the message that we need. It's all about people and getting that message across. Now, just in finishing, I would like to mention, first of all, the wider developments, because you know I mentioned the sustainable development goals, but the um, uh, uh, Commonwealth has a blue charter. The European Commission has um, uh, uh, what, what, what it calls um, a communication in respect of um, a new approach for the sustainable blue economy in the EU and transforming the EU's blue economy for a sustainable future. And um, the, the um, Blue Economy Cooperative Research Centre um, is, is the process has been undertaken in Australia. So what you see there are three examples of where um, many, many countries, so all the Commonwealth countries, all the countries that are part of the European Commission, or in the case of Australia, a single country, are also adopting these sort of things. So it's becoming mainstream in terms of blue economy, in terms of balancing everything up. And I'd like just to illustrate um, a, a paper that came out very recently um, OSPAR is the Regional Sea Convention for the Northeast Atlantic, and on the right there's a map showing the OSPAR maritime area. Uh, to, um, it obviously includes the UK, and the UK uh, is within two of the five um, sub-regions for OSPAR, so OSPAR Region 2, Greater North Sea, and OSPAR Region 3, the Celtic Seas. Now what happened was that OSPAR, as part of its Northeast Atlantic Environment Strategy for 2030, concluded that by 2025, they needed to take account of ecosystem services and natural capital. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to assess and account for human activities and their consequences in the implementation of ecosystem-based management. They looked at four primary ecosystem services, uh, the provision of wild aquatic animals for nutrition, uh, materials of energy, provision of animals or products for agriculture, for nutrition, materials or energy, climate regulation, and outdoor recreation. And what they concluded actually was that the total asset value for the OSPAR region was 125.75 billion euros, of which 40% comes from carbon sequestration and outdoor recreation. So what we're seeing here is we are developing tools, we're improving the way it's becoming mainstream, and that's what we need to see happening 
and we're beginning to get better information, better tools. So basically, we need to get a balance. We need to get a balance between how we would like our seas to be, in other words, clean, safe, healthy, biodiverse, productive, ecosystems that have full natural functioning. But also, we have to think about the benefits, the economic benefits, the social benefits from tourism, fishing, shipping, agriculture, renewables, oil and gas, but also the consequences of greenhouse gas emissions. And what we have to do is we really need to balance up. And as we try to balance our blue growth objectives with our environmental and societal objectives, we need the tools to understand the interactions. And these tools are developing all the time, but we need people to get together. We need people to have discussions. We need people to really um, look at this and further develop concepts and ideas. But we also need people to be out there speaking about it. And whenever we speak about our ocean, speaking about environmental aspects, the societal benefits and the economic benefits. So the key messages are that the ocean is essential for life on Earth. We must act now to reverse human impacts on the ocean by improving ocean literacy. We need to go out there and tell people and help them to understand the consequences of our actions. Economic prosperity and well-being are embedded within nature. If nature is working well, it'll contribute significantly towards economic prosperity and well-being. So ultimately, the benefits to society and to marine ecosystems of the blue economy approach will help ensure that the ocean continues to function and provide the services that ultimately are essential for life on Earth. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Colin. Um, yeah, it's really fascinating to hear, especially kind of the evolution of um, this plan and vision and, and everything that's going on with it. So, yeah, thank you so much. Um, OK, so we've got about five minutes left now um, to get through some questions from everybody. Yeah, I'll, I'll get started with the first one then. So someone has asked, for the social aspects of the vision, how is the Scottish government ensuring that communities' views are considered in its delivery? Yeah, um, and, and the Scottish government actually is being quite proactive. And the first thing it did was it undertook the social um, attitude survey. Uh, and that was a key thing. But also in terms of development of the blue economy, it is running various um, opportunities for people to input to those sort of things. So this is um, about involving the people, involving industries, um, being out there. It, it is absolutely not um, an exclusive process. They, they are trying to make it a very inclusive. Now, unfortunately, I'm not directly involved in it anymore because I've retired. Um, and so I can't go into great detail about the processes, but I am aware that there are processes ongoing. Oh, OK, brilliant. Thanks. And if you want it. to find out more, uh, if you just contact the Marine Directorate at Scottish Government and they'll be able to, to give you details. Yeah, OK, yeah, that I was, I was going to ask, so would that be the best thing to do if, if yeah. anyone's listening today interested in collaborating somehow? Yeah, OK, brilliant. Thank you. Um, all right, so we've had some more questions come through. So someone has asked, how can decision makers, for example, consent applications, take better account of all of these factors in practice without making processes overly burdensome? Yeah, and, and you know, that's a really nice question because ultimately it, 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 it is a crux question <laughs> because historically, we, you know, we've, been, we, 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 we've looked at environmental aspects of it, but now we are beginning to look more at where the social aspects are, where the economic aspects are. And key is the type of information that's being provided. And that's why we produced um, Scotland's Mean Assessment 2020, where we didn't just look at, well, OK, so what is the environmental consequence? We started to, to look at this balance. And also, as, as has been illustrated through the, the OSPAR example, there are tools that are being developed that are actually better valuing 
um, the, the, if you like, the, the cost of what we're doing and trying to put figures onto the, um, you know, what, what the consequences of our actions. And the more we can get these tools to operate and the more we can look, for example, at cumulative human impacts. And that's been something that uh, has been developing over, over quite a period of time. And again, um, whereas, uh, you know, back when, when, when we did Scotland Seas towards understanding a state, we tended to be a bit more siloed in our thinking. By the time we came to Scotland's mean assessment, and indeed um, the, the OSPAR have just published the QSR 2023, and what you'll see in there is a lot more of the, the thinking being cross-sectoral, being multidisciplinary. And so the key ultimately is that we want to be able to provide the new tools that will make it less burdensome, that will, for, for those who are actually having to make the decisions, um, you can feed the information in and actually it'll come out with, a, with an answer at the end of the day. So it is about further development of tools, but there's a lot of activity going on into, into that area. Hey, brilliant. Yeah, that's great to know. Thanks so much, Colin. Um, okay, I think we should have just a bit more time for questions we've got through. So um, someone's asked, how do we get members of the public more engaged with considering their actions and how they impact on the ocean? Um, yeah. Your slide said people felt it was up to the government and business, but this is not the case. Absolutely. And part of it is um, about actually going out there. And if I could give you a wee local example, um, there was a, there's, there's a, a a lassie who did a, a PhD in marine science in, in Aberdeen. And after her PhD, she decided she wanted to set up uh, basically a marine information center. And it's called Greyhook Bay. It's now fully operational. It's um, positioned where you one of the best uh, places for watching dolphins in the country. And also, it is um, not connected to the electric grid. It's not connected to the water grid. It's a totally self-sustaining. It's got solar panels and collects rainwater and all sorts of stuff. And this is an example of an outreach, which, um, it, and, oh, sorry, there's a cafe there as well. And this is an example of an outreach because not only does it provide a cafe and there's binoculars so people can watch it, but it's, it's a major development in terms of communicating with the public. Another example is, you know, across in Oban, at the Scottish Association for Mean Science, they have the Explorer Centre, where again, it's a centre which um, has been designed for visitors to come of all ages, and they run a whole lot of different events. Um, they also put people out to schools uh, and that sort of stuff. Um, so it is about, people being um, very active about going out, about speaking, um, and, and also doing it in a way that, that um, really attracts people. And if you think about the consequence of the um, four or five minutes of the, the David Attenborough uh, whale plastic, uh, that had a huge consequence. And so it is about this communication with the people, but getting it right and making sure that at the end of the day, um, we, we're, we're not presenting necessarily a, a gloom and doom message because there is a very, very positive outcome at the end of the day. But these sort of outreach centers, people going out, there's now a lot more in terms of sort of marine festivals and, and um, uh, environment weeks and all that sort of stuff. And it's about getting involved. And, um, as I say, some people have taken it and it's now their life. Other people are, 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 are doing it in different ways. And my hope is that you know, these sort of events, I go out and give talks and all the rest of it. It is about this communication. It is about encouraging people. It is about meeting people in the street, um, you know, setting things up and, 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 and presenting it in, in a way. Because I think once people realize, most of them come on board straight away. Oh, amazing. Thank you, Colin. Um, yeah, really great to hear that example. It sounds like such a such an amazing project there as well. I'm sure lots of people uh, watching would be really keen to go and visit. 
locations well. Um, okay, so unfortunately, we're already out of time today, which is a real shame as we've had lots of great questions come in through the chat. So, um, yeah, just like to say a massive thank you to, to everybody for asking their questions and Colin for your uh, responses as well. Say again, thank you so much to everybody for joining and logging on today. I really hope that you found it useful. Um, and all I say is to just make sure to stay, um, sign up to our mailing list for the project so you can find out about any future activities we'll be running. Um, all right, well, that is everything from me. I'd like to just end with a massive thank you to Colin again. Uh, it's been really great to, to hear from you today. And um, yeah, thanks to everyone for joining.